El profesor Richard Boyaxi no necesita presentación. Eh, afortunadamente es un autor que ha sido muy traducido al castellano y tenemos libros de él sobre inteligencia emocional aplicada a las organizaciones y al liderazgo que son bestsellers tanto en su país, en Estados Unidos, como en Europa y en concreto en España. El profesor Richard Boyaxis es un experto en inteligencia emocional, pero un, intel un experto práctico. Es ¿eh? una persona que no solo es un teórico de la inteligencia emocional, sino que es una persona con una alta inteligencia emocional. My talk is about emotional intelligence, so I thought I should start with some. Uh, several British psychologists a few years ago did a study in which they showed that unless you arouse a person emotionally, their limbic brain, as much as their neocortical brain, you get very little retention. As a matter of fact, people retain about 40% in two days, 20% in five days. <clears throat> so, I thought, what better way to start here in España than with something about Bartha? Because every one of you in the audience is a Bartha fan or would like to be, right? No? Oh, no. In Italia, say, e peccato. <laughs> what? Not Real Madrid. No. Oh, okay, okay. I well. want to make uh, an academic point about um, a conceptual distinction that I think is very important for those of us working in this area. And that is, the argument I'm going to make is that for all of the arguments made in academic settings, for all of the confusion in practitioner settings about what is or is not emotional intelligence, I think we have all too often confused discussion of methods with, cons with discussion of the theory, and all of that serves us not well. So I am not going to argue for a particular different theory of EI today. I am not. But I'm actually arguing for we need a more complex definition of emotional intelligence. And what I think we need now is a multi-level complex notion about what is emotional intelligence. And I hope that part of what you um, can appreciate with my comments today, or maybe wonder about, because I'm going to offer them as intellectual tapas. It's not a whole meal, but it's the beginning. To start to say that if you develop a multi-level notion of emotional intelligence, you need different types of measures to work at the different levels. A competency in my definition is a capability or an ability that distinguishes effective performance. <clears throat> I have to be careful with the word competency. In the UK, I can't use it. I have to use the word capability. In Italia, competenze means something different. I have to use the word capacità. So the issue is here, or in any of the cultures that you represent, or languages, what's, what's the right concept for this? But what I mean by it is that a competency is a set of related behaviors, so it is not a skill, it's something more than a skill, organized around an underlying construct called intent, that distinguishes effective performance. If you only use the behavior or the skill of active listening. Now, 
most of us would say that active listening is, or being very attentively listening, is a skill that's associated with empathy. But it also can be used for other purposes. So you might actively listen to someone because you want to understand them. And we would then say, we'd make the attribution that you're demonstrating empathy. But you might demonstrate active listening with someone because you think they're not telling the truth and you want to catch them in a lie, thereby demonstrating a different competency which we would call influence. And Pablo, being the social person you are, you might demonstrate empathy because you're trying to listen to people's different views where there's some conflict because you want to bring them together, which would be a part of conflict management. The same skill, the same behavior in three different cases really representing three different competencies. In both of the prior definitions I gave you, you saw a very important statement about it leading to effective performance or um, superior performance. One of the things that drove the competency movement in the US around the research is inductive methods. We were trying to do is to say, if we start with effective performance in various roles, in various jobs, in various countries, in various sectors of society, what can we show that people have? These inductive methods meant that you started with worrying about looking at effective performers and less effective performers. Sometimes you actually had effective, outstanding, average, and poor performers. What that means is that you're driven toward extreme case designs in the research. So you identify a sample, a subsample of outstanding performers and a subsample of average, and that, that lends itself toward a certain type of research design and statistical methods. But the idea of a 360 degree analysis is that you get other people in, who are called informants to describe the person's behavior. And the theory is that if you get enough people around the person to describe their behavior, you're getting closer to it. And the idea is the more people around a person's world, life sphere, you can get, the more uh, dependable you have a picture of how they're acting. That people need to be an average performer. So they differentiate poor performance from average performance. And those tend to be things like you need some expertise and experience relevant to the activities you're doing. You tend to have some types of knowledge that are relevant, declarative, procedural, um, functional, metacognitive, etc. And there are an assortment of cognitive skills like memory, deductive reasoning. <clears throat> but in study after study, they don't distinguish outstanding from average. What they do distinguish is poor from average. I mean, the average from the poor. And we have, over the decades, tried to create a language that separates out the things that distinguish the effective from the average. Because the average is not effective. The average is, uh, the English word is mediocre. And no one should, and usually no one does aspire to be mediocre. You want to be effective. You want to make a difference. You want to contribute. You want to be outstanding. To summarize, again, a lot of decades of research in a lot of organizations, public, private, not-for-profit, large, small, that there are three clusters of competencies that typically distinguish outstanding managers and professionals. There are cognitive competencies. The two that always come out in these studies are systems thinking and pattern recognition. They're a set that we now call emotional intelligence that have to do with uh, degrees of self-awareness and how you're handling your own emotions. Um, like emotional self-awareness, emotional self-control, adaptability, achievement orientation, positive outlook. And there are social intelligence competencies that have to do with how you're tuning into other people around you, their emotions, and how you're handling the relationship. <clears throat> and it's to say that if you think about the human organism as a whole, so when I'm using personality in this sense. I don't mean the big five personality characteristics. I'm talking about what goes on in a human being's heart and mind and body. And if we look at that as what goes on in a person's psyche, 
There are neurological and endocrine processes which underlie what, what happens, what we do, what we think, what we feel. <clears throat> There are motivational and trait level, motive and trait levels that are unconscious, so you, by definition, are not aware of them. Your environment, the, the situations you're in, have more to determine whether your genes are turned on or off than whether you were born with them. Okay, so, one of the issues with this holistic notion that we're talking about ends up coming back to us in terms of how we think about which of these things we label as emotional or social intelligence competencies at this level of demonstrated behavior. Now, some people, in particular, David and I were talking about this morning, Jack Mayer, um, 10 years ago, had an article in which he claimed to be called emotional intelligence, it should correlate with a measure of intelligence. Um, I would contend that that would be true if you're down at this level of motives or traits, but that if you're up at this level of behaviors, it actually should be irrelevant. And in fact, we have a study which we haven't published yet, but um, because we're trying to finish the rewrites on the paper to get it out, but we did this with financial service executives. And again, we had the 360 throughout the self-assessment just to use the other's views of these top financial service executives before the crises happened. And by the way, they were in a company that hasn't been hurt by the crisis. Um, <clears throat> and then we had measures of their intelligence. We used uh, the Ravens progressive matrices and the Mill Hill vocabulary. <clears throat> then we used the Neo PR to look at personality dimensions. And then we followed their effectiveness of their units for one year later. And we knew in this organization that the more financial consultants that they can hire in a year predicts new business coming in, new dollars invested in their organization five years later. So we were looking for, in a one-year span, who could bring in new business. We controlled for size of the region. We controlled for climate, organizational climate in the region. And what we were able to show in the regression analyses is... Um, I think something that is grounding on this, the EISI competencies as demonstrated and seen by others significantly predicted this. G did not in the regressions and four of the five personality measures did not, conscientiousness did, which often shows up in these kinds of studies. So again, it raises an important sense that if you're looking at the behavioral level of how a person's acting day to day, week to week, what patterns are emerging in their behaviors, it gives us another window in terms of what they're doing and what they're able to do. One of the things that um, came out in actually your uh, shared article in 99, David, I thought it was, <clears throat> was that to be thought of as EI, it should reflect mental performance rather than preferred ways of behaving uh, have a positive correlation to other forms of uh, intelligence and increase with age and experience. Again, I'm not disputing the integrity of that or the relevance of that, but for the level I'm talking about, I would offer something that is related to these but diverges in a couple ways. And that what I had proposed um, in an article that Fabio Sala and I published in 2004 is that in fact, from our perspective, what a measure of emotional or social intelligence should do is be behavioral observable, related to specific neural endocrine systems, related to job and life outcomes, and of course the measures should show convergent and discriminant validity, which is to say it shouldn't be the same as um, Jack and Peter and David have shown, it, sh it shouldn't be highly uh, multicollinear with measures of personality. So this is the definition that I would use. I would contend that an emotional intelligence competency is an ability to recognize, understand, and use emotional information about yourself that, that's a typo, that leads to or causes effective performance. A social intelligence is an ability to recognize, understand, and use emotional information about others that leads to or causes effective performance. And even a cognitive intelligence competency, instead of the actual trait or underlying ability or capability, um, 
is to think, analyze information in situations that, again, leads to or causes effective performance. What's wrong with self-assessment? What, what dilemmas do we get into if we just ask people about it? If Pablo is my boss and he's evaluating me, then I should fill it out, not in terms of how I see me on the competencies, but how do I think Pablo will rate me? And that difference between how I think you'll rate me and how you rate me is a measure of self assessment. But the traditional measure of self-assessment of the self-other difference wasn't bad, it just wasn't as good. But in the process, he also showed something that always questions whether or not self-assessment on these types of behaviors are, are adequate. And that is that on the whole, the women in the sample, they were all professionals, managers, executives, underestimated themselves. Their self-view was underneath the others. And this is a consistent finding in the literature that women, professional women tend to be underestimators. And professional men tend to be overestimators. Now, the other thing about self-assessment is that it's very potent, but it's different in timing. So for those of us, I mean, many of you are very thin, but for those of us in the room that are volume challenged, you know, and we have to watch what we eat, we feel righteous when we have one bowl of salad in a day. Say, yes, I'm eating all that rabbit food. <laughs> but we may not be losing weight. So the self-assessment that we're doing something for it may be true, and if we continue to do it over weeks and weeks, it may work. Unfortunately for most of us, we do it one day, feel righteous, then the next day it's um, a bowl of pasta. And let me close with a couple observations. One of them is, if we're assessing anything, we have to be very thoughtful about cross-cultural differences. And cross-cultural differences aren't always the ones that the stereotypes give us. In gender stuff, if you just do normative descriptions, you come up with these stereotypes and you reinforce the stereotypes. But if you look at effectiveness, the stereotypes don't hold. The same thing goes, I think, in many cross-cultural comparisons. Uh, you uncover as being something that's a call for sensitivity when we move in and out of different cultures because the methods, and, and um, in particular, the methods need to be adjusted. Lastly, um, occasionally at academic conferences, um, people say things to me or around me like, well, emotional intelligence is interesting, but it's never been linked to effectiveness. Um, and David and I have been on many panels where um, we have people who actually get up and start their speeches that way. Well, I think that's ridiculous. Uh, to me, it actually makes a person seem stupid because they're not reading. So uh, what I wanted to do is just start to tell you quick examples, a few examples of how much of this stuff is actually published. These are just two issues of uh, the Journal of Management Development, one on competencies um, in North America and the 2009 one's about to come out, competencies in the EU. They have a series of articles um, on everything from naval officers to large company executives to not-for-profits and to development, uh, in particular, in MBA settings. I see it as some tapas. So, uh, we're around, I'm around, those of us who are working on this stuff at Asade are here for the next two days. So if you have questions, please ask us um, or email us, okay? And thank you and have good refreshments.